Hey, what's going on, champs? I'm Erin Deliosa. Welcome to an Immigrant's Life podcast, my podcast about immigrants and immigration and everything in between. Thank you for listening and downloading the show, and thank you for supporting my dad. Second month of the year, and we're going to open up with an incredible guest. But first, house chores. I want to express my gratitude for the people that have reached out to me and gave me all their kind words regarding the podcast. Gestures like that pushes me to keep on going, so thank you very much. Also, I want to thank all the people that have given the podcast a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's steadily growing thanks to you, but for the ones that haven't done it, I'd appreciate it if you could go ahead and give us a five-star. It really helps the podcast reach more audience, so please go ahead. Of course, as I remind you every week, you can follow us on all the social media at An Immigrant's Life. Been trying to post new things on that, so please check it out. Now, let's talk about this week's episode. This week's guest is an admirable and gracious individual, and I enjoy this bisiera with her. That's my bad Russian for the word conversation. So, without further ado, let's get into the show. Isa, dalawa, tatlo. Today's guest is an engineer and an entrepreneur. Coming from the Garden State of the US of A, by the way of the country of the Great Step, everyone, please welcome Dana Utembayeva. Hi. What's going on, Dana? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's actually my first time doing a podcast. Awesome. I love it. I love it when people come and <laughs> like, oh, it's my first time. I'm like, I see you all the time on video and no one ever, <laughs> you know, like everyone has a podcast now, you know? I know. Yeah. But, I always wanted to be a part of a podcast, but uh, you, I, when I spoke to you, you were really nice and compassionate, hmm. uh, understanding, and I loved your mission. So that's why I was like, yeah, let's do it. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm a little bit nervous, but, you know. We got this. You're always on this. camera. What are you talking about? You have this amazing, <laughs> beautiful videos and funny, hilarious videos. Yeah, but it's all scripted. You know, it's timed, but just talking and recording, it's a little bit different. So I'm glad to. I'm glad that we're doing this. Mm-hmm. Aaron, you're, you're awesome. So mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, it'll be great. Awesome. It will be great for sure. But before, be we, before it becomes great, you want to promote anything? Uh, it's definitely. Um, well, I... My goal is to, you know, bring better representation of Kazakhstan and Central Asia in the United States, mm. because unfortunately for a lot of people, the only way they know Kazakhstan is through Borat. <laughs> I just saw Borat, actually. <laughs> you just saw Borat, no, which I think, it's, I think it's a funny movie, but I mean, the movie, the first movie is what, 16 years old now at this point. Mm-hmm. So I'm, um, I'm hoping to, for people to, you know, see, see Kazakhstan and people that are from Kazakhstan that are living in the U.S., Mm-hmm. And immigrants, uh, you know, beyond that movie and just uh, be a better representation for, you know, Kazakhstani diaspora here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And this is why if you are on TikTok or Instagram, please, you know, check my profiles out and check out the videos and let me know what you guys think. That, that's love- about it. <laughs> it's perfect. I love it. I love it. Hey, by the way, ch- for you guys listening. Check out the videos. I love the videos. Do you write them down? <laughs> Who writes them? You or do you have a help? No, I write them. Um, it's usually like uh, an inspiration that will come to me. Uh, majority of the time, it's like when I'm in the shower or when I'm doing something completely random, not yeah. even related to TikTok or videos. And it'll come to me and I will you know, quickly write the script down. I do try to um, release a video every, every day. Uh, so thankfully, when there's like a, flow of creativity i try to harness it as much as possible and write it myself Mm -hmm. and then also my fiance helps me out with like editing and proof editing um even like some words that i can't pronounce (laughs) in english (laughs) he helps me with that as well what are you talking about you speak fluent (laughs) english i i do thank you but like sometimes when you're tired and like you see a new word you're like and then you know how sometimes you know this right like english is your what second language third fourth (laughs) <laughs> second yeah second yeah you know sometimes like when you stare at a word for a really long time you're like 
wait, what is, am I, am I pronouncing it correctly? <laughs> is this a real word? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes that happens, especially when you're repeating the same sentence over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. That happens. Yeah. How long does it take to shoot a video? Uh, the shooting itself, I would say maybe probably like 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. But, uh, me being, a, I, like, we want to be, make it perfect. Uh, sometimes it could take longer than that because of reshooting and re-editing. Sometimes it can take a few hours if um if I don't have much to do, if nothing is rushing me, then yeah. But I try to do it within like the 30 minute time frame. Oh, sweet, sweet. Anyways, you mentioned you're from Kazakhstan. Where exactly from Kazakhstan were you from? So I was born in Almaty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the Kazakhstan government changed the capital in 1998 okay. from Almaty to Astana. And then we moved to Astana. So I was eight years old at the time. Um, so I really don't remember that much growing up in Almaty. Of course, I mean, I, I remember a whole lot, but a lot of my like, growing up mm-hmm. was in Astana. So like, if people ask me where I'm from, I usually tell them that I'm from Astana. Mm-hmm. Why did yeah. you guys move? Uh, because it became a capital and there was like job opportunities for the family. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, to like draw a parallel and to compare uh Astana is like Washington DC and Almaty is like New York City. <laughs> the cool so in one. terms of like the cool one, yes. In terms of like government work, it was it was it was more jobs in the new capital because they were building it. So that's why they mo- we moved. Mm. And we moved in a dead ass winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wait, wait, what kind of winter are we talking about? Because it could be like winter, you know, Canadian winter or Russian winter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh so whatever your picture, God. whatever you're picturing, that's what it was like. And then at the time, uh, Astana wasn't really built built up yet. It was a, a new a new town, hmm. um, and the flights from Almaty and Astana, like the domestic flights, weren't that established at the time. So we took the train. The train takes about you know twenty hours, and then. <laughs> 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 it's a it's a really like it's a really far distance across two cities and then i remember we arrived and you know we arrived and it was like a winter blizzard it's cold oh it's like God. minus 30 degrees celsius mm-hmm. um again blizzard uh, like you know the snow snow is up to your face i was like what the heck and i was eight years old i was crying mm-hmm. to my parents and i was like you you brought me here i didn't want to come with you <laughs> why did you bring me here and they're like it's okay it's okay down and like you'll get used to it yeah eventually you get used to it yeah yeah i mean kids yeah. you know kids yeah We're resilient do you have siblings i do i have an older brother um he's still in kazakhstan but he's like 15 years older than me so when i moved to the u.s uh he stayed he was like i have my life here i'm established you're good go <laughs> you're the sac- yeah. sacrificial lamb yeah sacrificial lamb you go you figure it out yeah, That's we'll funny. see you. <laughs> I saw that on your TikTok or Instagram that your mom's ethnically Korean. How did she end up in Kazakhstan? So uh, Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union, right? It was hmm. uh, we uh, Kazakhstan became an independent country in 1991. My mom was actually born in Uzbekistan. Okay. Then she moved to Russia. Then she eventually moved to Kazakhstan. Met my dad there. Uh, but there's a lot of ethnical Koreans in, uh, you know, post-Soviet republics. There's a lot of them in Central Asia because uh, back in at the end of like 1800s, a lot of Koreans immigrated from Korea uh, due to the war. So they immigrated to Far East Russia. Mm. Um, and then there was uh, during Soviet Union times, there was a lot of deportations of Koreans um, and they were deport- deported in mass in- to Central Asia. So there's a whole Korean diaspora there in Central Asia, and she actually grew up and was born in one of those, you know, Korean communities in mm. Uzbekistan. And then when she was a teenager, they actually moved to Russia, and she studied there, worked, then moved to Kazakhstan and met my dad. Okay, D- but she was actually sec- third generation, third generation Korean. Okay, so she's Kazakhstani. Yeah, she's Kazakhstani. Saying, yeah. yeah, but I didn't know that, by the way. Thank God I followed you. I'm like, this is real? This yeah. is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because even, because I've met, obviously I've met a lot of Koreans from South Korea in the U.S. Um, and then when I tell them kind of how it happens, a lot of them are unaware as well mm-hmm. um, about the, there being such large 
uh, Korean communities in Central Asia and Russia as well. So they're surprised. They, they're surprised too. So it's a not not a very known fact. However, you know, in Central Asia, in our countries, like Korean culture is loved and it's very much part of our culture in mm -hmm. general. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's cool, man. So when you move to that, what's that, Almaty? Not Almaty, the other one. Astana. Astana. Mm -hmm. How was your childhood there? Was it good? Did you actually enjoy it later? Yeah, I did enjoy it. Of course, the move itself, the first year, I was like, what the heck am I doing here? My parents brought me here by force against my will. <laughs> <laughs> I have all my friends. I told them, like, I have my friends. Me eight, being eight years old, right? I was like, mm. I have all my friends here. I have my life here. <laughs> They're like, okay, well, like, what life are you talking about? <laughs> You're in first grade, child. Um, but yeah, like, so the first, the first year, um, it was a little. I mean, in the beginning, it was a little tough. I didn't have any friends, but then I was, you know, went to school and met people, met made a lot of friends, and I forgot really quickly. <laughs> yeah. About me being upset and being moved, but yeah, I had a really happy childhood, despite it being really super cold. Mm -hmm. It was really, really cold. Yeah. Were you? Socially, economically, if you don't mind me asking, were you doing well? Were you guys okay? Yes, we were okay. Um, in the beginning, obviously, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was tough for my parents. Mm -hmm. Nothing that I have, nothing that I noticed, right? Like they, they did their best. Mm -hmm. And when I was born, I was uh, had a really, really happy childhood. And then when I was getting older, yeah, we were like, you know, my family is really educated and intelligent. My father worked in the government. So we mm -hmm. were uh, really pretty well off. I would say yeah the government yeah. <laughs> government yeah <laughs> i have the sense of it when i, I was seeing your your uh, i don't know like talking to people now you know doing the parks for a, for a bit now i can sense like okay she is well off back home you know what i mean like yeah but uh, that i love that i love i love that i could talk to different people and just like yeah you know, it, sure. that's what i was talking to a friend about this like in canada it doesn't matter what you are you back in back home or if you're the janitor or you're the mayor or whatever you are, here you have the sense of like you're equal. Yes. You know? And I know it's interesting because it's interesting because in the US, whenever you tell people that you're an immigrant, or whenever you talk about immigration in the mm. US, mm. um, obviously there's this like the story that's been regurgitated over and over again, right? Like, oh, I came here with nothing but two dollars in my pocket, and <laughs> yeah, like, which I call bullshit, by the way. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I was like, how do you travel? But um, and I'm sure there's a lot of stories like that. But the thing is that like they obviously get more attention, right? And this is the story that keeps regurgitating. And a lot of times when you tell people that you're an immigrant, they often think that you come from. Uh, a poor background mm. or from this is, you know, you're not that ed educated and there's a lot of like uh, stereotypes surrounding the word immigrant, right? Yeah, yeah. However, immigration is like, I don't know if this is a correct statistics. I think I know at least for like where I live, I think every one fourth person is an immigrant, right? So if such a large population are immigrants, like there's no way that they can be all the same socioeconomic no way. status. There's mm. no way. And this is why like the Immigrants' experience is very, 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 very broad. Doesn't you didn't move here just because you're, you know, poor, or you were struggling? There's there could be many, many other different reasons. Yeah, like so that, that was also the school, yeah, yeah, education, or I don't know, like marriage or travel. <laughs> right? Well, travel. There's yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of is, like issues and things that like, people want to solve. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I like what you touch about education because I also saw on your post that it didn't even dawn on me that in communist Russia, education was free. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that makes sense because it's, you know, everyone's equal. Yeah, well, yes. There was, the, I mean, despite despite that, there was a lot of classism, but um, education was a, you know, free right to every citizen now. Who is a citizen and what is a right is obviously you can you know we can dive into that <laughs> uh, in, more in depth later, right? But it, it was free, um, and uh, the literacy rates are way above like ninety eight percent in every post Soviet country. Actually, wow. um, I think I believe in Kazakhstan it's about ninety eight ninety nine percent of you know literacy rates. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people um, like having a bachelor's degree is pretty normal and standard and you're not really going to 
surprise anyone by telling them that you went to a university, mm. um, whether it's, you know, back home or whether it's abroad. I think it's just way too normal. And then I was, I was actually surprised when I first came to the U.S. And I also came in 2006. Like, do you, do you remember in 2006, like Facebook? It wasn't like it is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just like, really... I'm going to check my ex-boyfriend's life now. Exactly. And all you can check is really their statuses and their out Facebook albums. Mm -hmm. But like people weren't really sharing photos at the time. People weren't sharing news articles. So mm -hmm. um, I was really surprised when I came to the U.S. and learned about how the education is actually set up. That it's not really like centralized and standardized like it is back in the motherland. So that was interesting. Not that I'm saying that it's bad or that it's wrong. It's just different. Yeah, it's yeah. just different. It's just different. You touch up on this, and I actually prepared this, and I'm not setting you up, but I I need to. We need to talk about Borat more. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Okay, because I want to talk not because of the character or whatever, but I mm -hmm. just want to know how it affected Kazakhstani community. Was it a negative thing or a positive thing? Um. So. So the first movie came out in 2006, and it was actually the year that I came to the U.S. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I remember, like, the posters and the movie posters were, like, all over. Um, and obviously, it was, like, it would create such a buzz, mm. right? And the movie itself was really provocative. And the movie itself is very uh, not censored, right? It brings to light a lot of issues. So... Mm -hmm. People, people wanted to talk about it. And of course, um, you know, 16 years later, I'm still getting the same jokes about Borat, actually. Seriously? You know, if you go to my TikTok, I was, I'm still like, whenever I talk about Kazakhstan, like the first comments are always about Borat. And it's, some, it's a con <laughs> I know. And it's actually common. Like, it's actually a, the word Borat. Um, I ended up having to filter that in my TikTok because mm. it just... It, it was so much that it was actually um, I couldn't keep up with the messages from, you know, the real real questions that people are asking. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a lot of people, a lot of people find it funny. Um, however, a lot of people are, um, I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't even say pissed. I would just say hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, they're hurt because it's it's a completely false representation of the country, right? Borat itself, himself. Sasha Baron Cohen is not from Kazakhstan. Yeah. Um, in the movie, they speak speak uh, a different language the movie is shot in Romania so it's a com not an accurate representation of the country and this is something that you know people in Kazakhstan wanted Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen to actually clarify or actually speak out on like to say that like hey like this is not accurate it's just a joke uh, but he's been pretty quiet about it um, I know the government of Kazakhstan tried to invite him to the country and he was like Nah, I'm not coming. <laughs> like, I don't know what you guys are going to do to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you guys are do to me. Like, and I can't, can't really, can't really blame him. Um, but I know. And then the second movie obviously came out. But I'm actually just surprised how people don't know much about Kazakhstan, and it's 2022. Like, I understand. I understand. Back in 2006, hmm. I get it. Like, there wasn't much social media, and like, you weren't really able to reach a larger audience online like we can now uh but to be honest it's a little surprising now i'm surprised that it's still the only representation people have of the country people are busy with their own bullshit you know yeah for sure so they, <laughs> and I, i'm not gonna lie when i start, I met you i'm like okay i'm gonna check out kazakhstan and then i found out it's like there's so much beautiful buildings architecture is just beautiful yeah, it's good because because when you do actually look into it, it really blows your mind because it's not something that you imagine when you you know picture the country. Obviously, obviously, I'm not saying that we're like, you know, like super 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 developed. Oh, for the record, I didn't think it was. It looked like Borat's like how she, <laughs> he showed it. Like I was like, okay, that's not true. I'm pretty sure that's not true. <laughs> no, I mean you you've seen you probably have seen like the larger cities, but. You know, if you go outside of Kazakhstan, like outside of the you know larger cities into the regions, we're very much pretty accurate. I would say, like people do live in villages and mm. they suffer from not having proper, you know, proper plumbing and proper schools and hospitals and things like that. So it really depends on where you go. But I mean, regardless, it's not the light. People don't want to be seen in that light in Western media. Yeah, because so. it sticks. Yeah, it like sticks. How, yeah, I was like, I was. You know that documentary 
the problem with Apu? The problem with Apu? Yeah, it's it. You know the the Simpson character. Yeah. And yeah, how yeah. it and how it affected uh, South Asian people. Oh uh, yeah. It remind me of that. Like okay, you know, like for me, sometimes people just I don't know too sensitive sometimes. Like yeah. come on, man! Like there's a representation. I know Apu. Apu wasn't a bad represent for me at least. Obviously, I'm not South uh, Asian. Like for me, it wasn't. He, he, hey, he owns a business. Mm-hmm. What's the problem? It's not like, you know, Borat was bad, man. Like, he was showing, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, women are in the cage or something like that. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, Borat. I mean, I don't know. The thing is that, like, I, I, I believe that there's a, like, you know, larger population will look at the movie or look at these stereotypes and, like, you know, and they will think, oh, this is just done for, um, you know, the content or for entertainment. But there's a lot of people that are not able to see beyond that and i think subconsciously those stereotypes do stick and then when someone mm-hmm. tells you like oh i'm from kazakhstan they're like i swear like i could tell in people's faces i'm like yo, 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 yo. <laughs> i'm like yo he's about to say it like Dude. and then they'll say something about borat and i'm like i always think like no you think you're so original like this joke is so old i know like i kind of when you told me like people still make the joke I'm like come on dude like everybody knows the <laughs> joke like it's not... Everyone knows the joke. It's the same. It's the Let same joke on. over and over again. Yeah, and they always oh. think that I'm the first one to hear it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Did you did you ever like pretend like what is that? Like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I actually haven't. Maybe it's a good, maybe it's a good, uh, <laughs> good way to do it. Maybe next time someone asks me, I'm gonna be like, no, no, I haven't seen it. No, I like that idea. I'll, I'll use that next time. I'll let yeah. you know how it goes. Yeah, let me know. I'd love to hear <laughs> I'll it. Do it. No, maybe it'll so be you... my next TikTok. So you say you moved to America. When, how did you end up in America? Why did you move? Uh, so my family always wanted me to study abroad. Mm. Um, they, they did realize that, you know, higher education abroad is much better quality than it is in Kazakhstan, which is true. Mm. Um, I think, uh, you know, middle schools, high schools, they're, they're great in Kazakhstan in terms of education. But higher education, they always wanted me to pursue it abroad. Uh, so we were debating whether it was England and America. And then, you know, because the political situation in Kazakhstan was unstable at the time. And they're like, you know, America is far enough. It's really far. <laughs> <laughs> and you moved so, alone, right? Yeah, I moved alone. Oh, but wow. it, it, it's not like I moved with $2 in my pocket. Aaron. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I applied to a boarding school. So after 10th grade, um, I went to a boarding school in the U.S. Hmm. Um, we have 11 grades, uh, but in the U.S. we have 12 grades. Hmm. So I just did an extra year of high school, which actually helped me because I prepared for like college, you know, prepared for the SATs, so hmm. all the tests, um, you know, improved my English. Um, yeah, and how then, was your English then? I thought my English was good. We all did. We all did. <laughs> You know how it is, and then you come here and people talk to you. You're like, "What? Why are you speaking like that? You sound I'm weird. Like, you sound so weird. You don't sound like my textbooks at all." You know, like, "Good morning. How are you?" And they're like, "What's up?" I'm like, yeah, what's up? And you're like, uh, <laughs> "The sky." Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um. And I learned. Uh, I learned British English. Like all our textbooks were British English, probably like yours, right? Oh, uh, we're American. Very American. American. Yeah. yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. still, you know, there's still you you're trying to read like you said from the textbook. Hey, how are you today, sir? You know what I mean? How do you do? Yeah, how do you do? And then I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, man? And then you, yeah, you, like, and then you prepare for like you like prepare vocabulary, like quote unquote big words, and then you use it here and be like, what the hell are you talking about? I know. And then like what remember the uh Past per, past participle, per, past present continue. Like nobody uses that. I don't. I'm not, I was like, why did I spend so much time of my life trying to learn that when nobody really gives a shit? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, my I thought my English was good, and then I came here, and honest, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. Like my first year in America was a complete culture shock. Like I thought mm. I was prepared mm. by watch, watching all these movies. I was not prepared. <laughs> I was not prepared. Um, and then the boarding school that I applied to and I went to was actually located in Maine, mm. which is your neighbor. Yep. 
And back then, I thought, you know, the entire America is like New York City. <laughs> and then I came to May and I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> Everybody um, did as well. Every, did you think like that? No. <laughs> no. No, okay. No, because <laughs> we're very Americanized. Yeah. And then, you, you know, are? yeah, we're very Americanized. So, and then I start, you know, I read and I'm like, there is no way the whole country is like that. There's no way. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But no, you I were young. Like that. But you were young. You didn't know. You were young too. How yeah, I was you? 20. Oh, okay. I was 16. Exactly. It's a little bit of it's a little bit of an excuse. Mm-hmm. A little bit. But yeah, like I remember I moved and yeah, Maine. Maine was interesting. Why? But yeah. Uh it was uh I applied to a few schools. I applied pretty late and it was like a rolling admissions at the time. So I was accepted to two schools, the one in Maine and then one in Pennsylvania. And I chose the one in Maine. Why? I don't know. Because now I'm thinking back to it. I'm like, why didn't I go to Pennsylvania? And not to talk shit, but Maine, Maine is actually beautiful. I had an amazing time. The school was great. Mm. Um, but in the beginning, I didn't, I was like, to me, Pennsylvania, Maine, it's all the same. Honestly. <laughs> it's it actually it rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, so yeah the time was all the same and then uh like a year like a, two semesters in i was like well i don't want to go back to Kazakhstan. like i don't want to go back and live my life there mm-hmm. um i i enjoyed living in america i liked america i liked americans and i was like i'm gonna stay why why do I you stayed. like america why do i like america yeah and americans too um i like who i am in america I like that. Let's talk about that. What do you well, mean? Let's talk that? about it. Let's. Uh, it just it just came to me. I like who I am in America. I like that I can be. I can. I don't know. There's like there's there's certain mentality back in Kazakhstan. At least when I when I left, um, there's certain roles that you know that the society puts on you. There's certain expectations that society puts on you, um, and I felt like at the time when I was 16, I had a lot of goals that I wanted to achieve in my life a lot Mm. of things that I wanted to do and I just thought that I can't I have to be myself to do that and if I'm not myself I don't think I'm going to achieve it Mm. if that makes sense I don't think I I don't think I thought about it like that when I was 16 because instead when I was 16 I was like well this is so much better and because I found sucks and I was you know (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but now like going through my feelings back then I think that's what it was like I just liked who I was I liked um that I was way more open. Mm. Um, I was. I. I didn't feel like I was held back. You know, um, in a way, like because I'm. I'm a woman, so being a woman in Central Asia is a little bit different, right, mm-hmm. than being a man in Central Asia. Um, and then I didn't like. I also wanted to live in a country where I'm safe and I have secure, like, financial future and good future. And I didn't feel like that is going to happen for me in Kazakhstan. Your dad works for the government. What's going on? <laughs> well, my dad passed away, so oh, there's I'm no. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so at you know at the time it was really unstable. Oh, okay. Um, and it was just kind of like a. It was a general consensus in the family that was like, yeah, there isn't much here, and I also felt that personally. And actually, like the recent events in Kazakhstan, yeah. uh, the entire time I was like, oh, shit, like I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> you know, not that I'm saying that America is a perfect country, but regardless, I'm glad I'm here. There's level to it. There's levels to it. There's you know, no perfect no. country. Exactly. Yeah. Like Canada's pretty awesome. I'm gonna tell you, it's awesome. But there are problems too. You know. Yeah. Like that's why sometimes some of my friends here that grew up, were born here, grew up here, white, and they'll be mm-hmm. like, "Oh, Canada sucks." Like, yo, you don't know. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> Something they'll be like, you know, because they're doing the mandates for like the COVID passport mandate, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're like, bro, this is fascism. Like, what are you talking about fascism? You don't know <laughs> fascism, bro. You don't you, know fascism. You don't know no. to take away freedom. They'll be like, oh, we have curfew. I grew up in the Philippines. There's always curfew. Right now, there is still curfew. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, you'll know. No, there's yeah, there's a lot of people that like to compare... Uh, COVID mandates with communism. <laughs> I was like, what? You I'm don't like, no, know, no, no. dude. You don't know. 
you don't know. And then it's like, I also grew up in a post-Soviet country, so we didn't really have communism, but like, from, at least from what my family says, it wasn't that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just want them to like, I don't want them to go through that, obviously, but. Of course not. I would appreciate it. I don't tell them like, don't say that because it's not my, you know, position and they would not understand anyway. Right. Yeah. Because they would never, hopefully they'll never have to feel it, but. It's a blessing that they won't. Right? Exactly. It's a blessing they, that they won't understand it now. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, sometimes, like I told you, I'm not, I don't have a, I didn't have a dad that works for the government in the Philippines, you know? So we're, mm -hmm. we're very poor people. And sometimes, like, sometimes I tell people like, oh, I, you know, there were a few times when I was young that, you know, we didn't have food, so we just have to go to bed and sleep. Yeah. You know, and so I say sometimes to my friends as a joke, like, you never had the feeling to go to bed hungry. Hungry. Yeah. And they'll be like, yes, I have. I said, no, 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 no. There's a difference between you chose to go to bed yeah. hungry. I didn't have a choice. There's nothing to eat. Yeah, exactly. You know what that, I mean? Like, yeah, like when, yeah, when that option is taken away from you, that it, it feels completely different. When you're just going to bed hungry. But you do have an option to look at food. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I, I know it sucks that there's this pa mandate or there's this, like, passport wherever you go. It sucks. I do. I, I feel it. But trust me, it's not close. Yeah, it's not close. And it's interesting, like, uh, I just, I spoke with my nephew and he lives in Kazakhstan. Mm. And uh, you remember you and I were talking and when, when everything was happening in Kazakhstan, like, they completely shut down internet and phone connections mm -hmm. for days, right? Uh, and this is a very common practice in many countries. And I'm sure, do they do, they do this in Philippines? Mm -hmm. Strategy. Mm -hmm. So strategy, yeah. So you know that this is a very, very, very common thing that they do in lots of countries, right? So then I was talking to my nephew and we're talking about, you know, protests that happened in the U.S. recently. Mm -hmm. And he goes to, and he genuinely asked me this question. He was like, wait, so like during protests, they don't shut down your phone lines and internet <laughs> in America? And I'm like, no, <laughs> this isn't normal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like, wait, he doesn't have... <laughs> Yeah, like, wait, they don't, they don't do that here? And I'm like, no, I'm like, this isn't normal. This isn't normal to shut everything down. I'm like, I, of, co of course, when there's like a large, you know, surge of phone calls at the same time, because some an event happens, you'll have network issues. But the government doesn't go and like shut everything down so you don't talk to each other. I'm like, this is not normal. And then I was like thinking about it. And I'm like, this is really sad that he thinks it's a norm. And he's so used to it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He, and yeah. then the, how many people, how many people there like, from you know our countries like they're super used to it they're like oh you know it is what I'll it just, is it is what it is but it builds bad. resilient i find it's bad yes, it i get it but it builds resilient it builds resilience so but when also they... on the other hand i'm sorry, oh, sorry also, also on the other hand there's like it'd be a lot of you know large population also becomes complacent yeah you know i agree and scare tactics work too. work too right i love it yeah. i love that like i love that perspective so for the people that doesn't know, what happened in Kazakhstan recently? What's up with the unrest? What's up with the unrest? So, um, so on January 2nd, uh, there was a protest that had started in the west of Kazakhstan uh, over spike in uh, fuel prices. Mm. And this is something that I have started talking about, obviously, on TikTok and on Instagram. That you've seen it, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people get surprised over well, are you seriously protesting because of fuel prices? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, even though Kazakhstan is an oil-rich country, a lot of people cannot afford petroleum gas in their cars. Mm. So what they have been doing is that they have been converting their cars to liquefied gas. Because no it's cheaper. Way. Yeah, liquefied gas is cheaper. I, th I think there's, I think west of Kazakhstan, I think over 70% of cars have been like transferred to be running on liquefied gas. And then people wake up and then the next day they basically doubled the price on liquefied gas. Doubled overnight. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so, and we already live, like people already live in the country, right? And 80% 80 of the population of Kazakhstan lives outside big cities mm. so in the region, in the regions. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that they have the best life. So I think it's just what something that pushed people over the edge. 
Okay. And it started as a small protest, and it's very I think it's very normal for people to go protest because of prices or something that they don't like with their job. It's very common, right? It's very common yeah, in the sure. U.S., common in Canada, it's common in Europe. Like people in France protest all the time. <laughs> and so, yeah, it started out pretty small. Uh, but the significance of it is that 10 years ago, uh, people were protesting in the west of Kazakhstan, the same, same place. And a lot of people don't actually know what happened, but the protests have been violently shut down. Mm. Like people were shot. So because of in memory of, you know, this 10 year anniversary of what happened, a lot of people got very angry over the protests because they're like, well, what if these protests happen again? And, you know, these protesters are going to be shut down violently by the government, Mm -hmm. which raised a lot of, uh, I guess, their um, issues with the government um, and people's feelings and emotions towards the government kind of like were brought up, you know. And so a lot of cities across Kazakhstan, a lot of people from a lot of, a lot of cities started protesting as well. Mm-hmm. And a few days later, there was a group, a um, violent group that took advantage of the peaceful protesters and started looting the city of Almaty. Oh, boy. Yeah, so they were, they were looting, they were violent. Um, the, the Almaty was pretty much decimated, so it was going on for days. And meanwhile, while this was happening... Uh, Kazakhstan's government basically shut down the internet and phone connections. And and then, you know, a state of emergency was announced. There was a curfew for days. I think curfew was just lifted yesterday. Um, mm. Internet is back full time. But because internet was down for such a long time, we still don't really know what happened. I mm-hmm. mean, we can only guess. I mean, we can completely rely on government own state media and well, just go with what they say. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but nothing happened. Everything was good. We're just having a party. Just having a party, yes. Um the government did say that there was like twenty thousand terrorists that attacked the city. Mm. And then, you know, the troops from neighboring countries had to be brought in for help. Uh for example, first there was like five thousand people from Russia and Belarus, like soldiers that were helping with the you know, with the violent group in Almaty. So mm. for days, people were like in lockdown because they were shooting on the streets. Mm. But again, there's no official numbers. Uh, we don't know who organized the group, who's behind the group. We don't know. We There's a lot we still don't know. And actually, mm. when I was talking to people, when internet was finally back on, their, their news cycle and what they're getting in the news was like two days late. Wow. So there was, there was, there was a lot of moments where actually we knew more like us living abroad, we knew more than people inside Kazakhstan. Yeah, um, that's that's normal. That's normal. That's like normal. for you, know, for you, you know. to, yeah, yeah. That's like sometimes I'll talk to my cousin. Like, how do you know? I'm like, I don't know. They they send me messages, <laughs> <laughs> and then like yeah. literally like the next town over. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But before, how's your family? They're okay. They're good. Everyone is everyone's safe, uh, healthy and safe. Psychologically, uh, I don't know. They're shaking up, obviously. Oh, They're traumatized kidding. about what happened. Yeah. I can imagine. But I'm, I'm hoping that everyone will be talking to someone at least, at the very least. But again, we don't know kind of uh, what happened. And I think that's what bothers people a lot. Yeah, the gray area. The gray area. It mm-hmm. really bothers people. But the, I think the truth is like we might never actually know the truth. Most likely. <laughs> Most likely. Yeah. Your mom's still there? Things go. Huh? Your mom, she still lives there? Uh, both of my parents passed away. When oh. I was in my 20s. I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. It's, a, it's okay. They, uh, it was a few years ago. Now it's, I, it's just my brother's family that live there. Mm-hmm. And then I have, you know, obviously my, a lot of my other relatives that live in Almaty mm. and Tostana. So a lot of them relatives that were in the city, in the center, um, yeah, they felt kind of like the big big portion of it because they heard the shootings and it was like literally under their windows mm-hmm. so it's scary yeah i love when you said like oh this is that's not the life it's not normal it's not Cause, normal cause sometimes, <laughs> sometimes i tell stories you know my stories to my friends here and they'll be like and i was like oh that's just life and they're like no 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 that's not life that's not <laughs> normal <laughs> you're not like supposed what? to like... kill your pet and eat them oh yeah no 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 but yeah 
it's yeah sometimes it's it's difficult it's difficult because all also like the mentality in countries like that right like where i'm from where you're from and mm. i'm and, and i'm sure it's it's very similar correct me if i'm wrong mm. uh the mentality of people living there is like oh like don't get involved in politics yeah. it's dirty business like just just don't get involved don't say anything you don't want to um, you don't want to vanish in the middle of the night well that you don't want to vanish in the middle of the night and like people just constantly are making it seem like it's taboo to talk about politics until it like you know hits you in the face until you have mm -hmm. no choice but it was always like that it was always like growing up it's like oh don't like don't like don't get involved like don't don't mention it don't talk about it especially you're a woman yeah for sure and then like you obviously there's like there's that you don't want to talk about politics and then we have issues with like domestic violence and it's always like oh it's a family family matter it's a family matter so there's obviously a lot of difference in mentality i'm not saying that everyone's like that but mm -hmm. just kind of know what, what's normal and what's not normal here and there mm -hmm. let's do yeah. politics let's talk about you <laughs> yeah not to get not to make the topics too grim no it's it's okay it's just... <laughs> I like talking politics too, but I just it riles me up, and then nothing and will happen. You know, I, I yeah. it really upsets it's, me. I know. So you moved to the U.S. How old were you again? Sixteen, you said. Sixteen, yes. Oh man, that time! Yeah. Did you suffer through dual identity through living the U.S.? Yeah, I think I still suffer from it sometimes, but um, it's much better. But I don't think even living in Kazakhstan. I was I didn't really feel full Kazakh because I'm mixed, mm. and people always reminded me of that. Oh, they make so you was, feel like yeah, you're half. Yeah, you're half. You're not pure Kazakh. Oh blah, blah, my blah. god. Which is which is now looking back, I'm like it's so stupid. Like who cares? But then like when you're 11 years old or 12 years old, it sticks with you. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> then I come to the U.S. and it's like I'm too foreign for here. And then after living here for so, such a long time, you go back and you're like, well, you're too American to be there. And then you're like, where <laughs> am I? <laughs> Life of an immigrant. Life of an immigrant, right? And then, um, and then, like, I lived in Maine and I lived in Pennsylvania, and there wasn't there wasn't much diversity. But now, now that I speak with a lot of immigrants, everyone feels exactly the same. So I was like, oh, okay. like we're all suffering together. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can form our own culture. That <laughs> you just said it. It is like very. How can I say? It? Like it's not kind of so funny. Like. Not Russian, but I forgot the word, but it's like, oh, if everybody's suffering, I'm okay with that too. Yeah. <laughs> At least I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> not that I want everyone to suffer. I think it's like identity crisis not, isn't, I hope it's not people don't suffer from it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you're like, yeah, you feel too foreign. Yeah. Sometimes, you know? Yeah. I feel that I completely feel the same. You came, you come here, you try to assimilate and you're like, oh, you're foreign. And then you find the kind of assimilate and then you go visit and they'll be like, you're not Filipino, you're Canadian. You go back. <laughs> like, no, what? what? <laughs> and then you're like in between, like, where do I go? Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's it's crazy. But again, this is our life. I, I love it. So I'm not going to complain. Yeah, of course. But like, do you, after 20 years, do you still feel not fully, I want to say fully Canadian, but like. After 20 years, do you feel sometimes a little foreign? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. sometimes. Like, oh, shit. Uh, so I usually, what I, I try to explain is, like, I have two brains. One Filipino brain, one Canadian brain. <laughs> so I'm, they're always arguing. Uh -huh. You know, like, like Filipinos, are, we're very famous for helping family out. One, pe one mm -hmm. person will immigrate, try to work hard work their, mm -hmm. themselves to the knuckles to and send money right yeah it's a great thing to help family of course but my canadian brain is like no live your <laughs> life be happy you don't know a owe anyone anything exactly right? okay send some money to mom and dad but the rest fuck them <laughs> that's the canadian brain huh okay. not not but that's the mm -hmm. western right like the western is like Think about you first before you individualism, think about yes. Exactly. Yeah. Very individualist. Yeah. You know, in Asia it's very like think about the family. family. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm in I'm stuck in the middle. Yeah. I think it's always gonna be like that, no? Oh, it's, it's it is what it is. It's gonna be it like that forever. Because <laughs> sometimes like I talk to my Filipino friends, 
that lives in the Philippines and then some that lives here. And then I said, I'll talk to my Canadian friends. I'm like, I don't know what to do, man. Sometimes I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes you talk with, you know, people that are born here, hmm. uh, in North America, let's say, to mm-hmm. unite us all. Uh, people that are born here, born and raised. And then like, you talk about family issues and they're like, well, just cut them out. You know, like, <laughs> cut them out. <laughs> Like, you have to draw some boundaries. I'm like, no, there are no boundaries. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Boundaries don't exist. Yeah. Like, I th- you can't I, just cut them out. <laughs> I like what you said there. Because sometimes, you know, I, I see people follow on Instagram or, like, people that I know. They'll they'll say, just cut them out. What are you talking about? This is family. <laughs> you don't just cut them out. You don't. But there I mean, has yes. to be some fine line. They yeah, I mean, I both. understand that, you know, your mental health and your your happiness is important. I understand, but I don't know about you, but my family is my happiness. Yeah. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can't just cut them out just because you had a fight. Yeah, or maybe because you're trying to achieve something and they kind of like opposes it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, there are some cultures though that are too conservative that, mm-hmm. oh, Dana, you have to marry a Kazakh or else you're oh. gone. <sighs> Oh, did I touch a nerve? <laughs> did I touch a nerve there? No, I'm fine. Like, I'm 31 years old now. This is way, way beyond that. But yeah, like, when I was 18, I was just like, no, no, no. But yeah, you, you know you know how it is. Yeah. I mean, I for me, uh, luckily, my family, they're very open, liberal. Mm-hmm. So my, my mm-hmm. wife is Canadian. So it was, it was never an issue. Sometimes there's some comments that comes out. Yeah. You know? But it's not a it's not big enough for me to you know to notice or bother to be bothered with. Yeah. How about you? Uh, no. In the beginning, there was always comments, hmm. and I think at this point, I've lived like half of my life here. At this point, it's just they're like, you know, she's American. <laughs> but in the beginning, she's American. Like we 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 lost her. <laughs> we lost her. <laughs> we lost her. <laughs> no I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Like, they fully accept that I'm American and I'm very, very proud of it. I never fail to repeat it to them all the time. And I'm always like, look, I'm American. This is how I think. This is my mentality. And this is something I fully accepted now. But before when I was like still battling all of this in my brain, mm-hmm. um, that you you have to either pick either you're American or you're Kazakh. Um, yeah, I was getting comments like that too. But it's not something to cut your family off. No. For or like discuss the with them toxic boundaries and things like that. I don't think that's uh, that that wasn't the case for me. Not with my family, no. That's yeah. good. That's good to hear. Yeah. But yeah, it's just like the idea of just cutting family off, that's nuts. Yeah. I'm sure there are some family members that should be cut off. Oh, yeah, definitely. I have done that. <laughs> you have? <laughs> no, How no, did no. that go? <laughs> no, no, my family is good. They're very open. They're like, again, like sometimes there's some comments like, I'm yeah. like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You but know? they're they're all, they're all in Canada, right? Majority of them. Yeah, majority of them. Like my main family, they're here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uncle, aunts, you know, they're spread all over the world there. But yeah, most of them, they're cool. They're very open. And... Filipino, Filipinos are we're very open to you are yeah. mixing to different cultures. We're always you been like that. mixed. Yeah, we're we've always been mixed because you know the Chinese came, the Arabs came, the Indians, and then Americans, and then well Spanish, and then American, and then the Japanese. But yeah. that's that's why I always brag that Filipino food is one of the best in the world. Oh, because it's so diverse. Yeah, we're very diverse, yeah. and and which helps us because we're very, we're not really xenophobic. We're nationalist, but we're not xenophobic, mm-hmm. which is really help. You know, in Kazakhstan, I'm assuming are not. It depends. It really depends where you're from. Um, I mean, a little bit. There's no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there's like that. Uh, xenophobic xenophobia. Mm-hmm. No, there is. There is. I can't. I can't really deny. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> At least uh, from like in my personal anecdotal evidence from you know, you know, friends and family and everything that I've seen around me because I can't mm-hmm. speak for the majority of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, people still want to marry within you know their own 
but I think it, it all I think it's because of you know Kazakhstan also is going through its own identity crisis. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been an independent country in decades and so long. This is the first like really it's a really really young country. Mm-hmm. It's before USSR was part of the Russian Empire. Mm-hmm. So it's it's just decades and decades of identity trying to be erased. So now people you know feel empowered to bring back the culture and identity. So I understand where it stems from. People want to preserve that as much as possible, mm-hmm. but people sometimes can be real assholes. So <laughs> yeah, that's everywhere though. You yeah, know. yeah, that's everywhere though. But it's interesting because sometimes like I, I meet a lot of Filipinos and like Filipino families, and you look at them so diverse. Yeah, and they're like, "You guys are all siblings." They're like, "Yeah, all siblings, all yeah. look different." They're like, yeah. cool. <laughs> like my last name is not Filipino; it's Spanish. Yeah, no, I met a lot. I met a lot of Filipinos with Spanish last name. Mm-hmm. And then they get they they get a lot of confused questions about it. Yeah, because they're like, the, "Why is your name Spanish? You look you look Chinese." Yeah, I feel you, man. <laughs> yeah, I saw that uh, you've been wrong for an Asian, and does it bother you? I am Asian. I consider myself Asian. Mm-hmm. Um, I consider myself Central Asian. I consider myself Asian American. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there's a lot of people from Kazakhstan that, that don't want to identify like that. I think it's just a personal preference. Mm-hmm. However, when I tell people I'm from Kazakhstan, they're like, so why do you look Asian? And I never know how to <laughs> properly answer that question. <laughs> I'm like, it's in Asia? And also, like, you, you know how it is. I don't think people... I know what people mean when they say Asian. Mm. You know, because, like, you know, India is in Asia. Yeah, yeah, like you know, like this Asian, like this guy like t- this, you're talking. Yeah, to. like the way the way the way you and I look. Exactly. Yeah, yes. With the slant eyes. The slanted eyes. Yes. Uh, high cheekbones, right? Mm-hmm. Black hair. You mean um, beautiful? I know, gorgeous, <laughs> just gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> They die for our hair. I know. And so I never know how to answer that question. I'm like, uh, yes. And like, and I don't want to make it seem like everyone looks like that, like that in Kazakhstan, because we don't. So I don't mm-hmm. know how to answer that question. A lot of times, I'm like, because I am Asian, mm-hmm. and that's and, that, and then they all look confused. And then they see me speaking Russian, so then it confuses them even more. And then I tell them that like, <laughs> the majority of Kazakhs are Muslim, and then it confuses them even more. And then I'm I also love five it. ten. I'm also really tall, mm. so people just are just like mind fucks. Yeah, <laughs> you just go. I'm a future human. This is what a future human yeah, will look like. Yeah, this is the evolution. You know right what I mean? Before you. <laughs> But you mix, good things happen. Exactly. That's Genetics. Funny, man. So you're very proud to be a Kazakhstani and American, but obviously you live in America and with our looks, right? Are you conscious mm-hmm. of representing your ethnicity in everyday life? Uh conscious you mean in a good way or yeah. in just a general mi- yeah, way like oh uh, I, you take pride like oh a good example right me when i was new here i'm like whatever i'm filipino i'm a person i don't represent them and then i realized like oh if i act a certain way all these people will think all filipinos act that way yeah so i put a little bit of pressure of myself like if i'm in public i'm like okay i'm gonna act like you know quote unquote decent <laughs> why because you want to be wild oh i'm <laughs> wild that's always that's always the case but i just don't want to represent my quote-unquote my people they're like people are like oh especially in my area is like all white right yeah so if they see me like oh that's what filipinos does like they just they're all assholes yeah gotcha unfortunately it's kind of a side effect of being a minority mm-hmm. right yeah in any minority i actually when the only the first time i realized that i look different or i am different is when i came to america uh, <laughs> but you know, you know <laughs> it, it was interesting because you know in kazakhstan like i look like every other person like nobody surprised much, yeah. for me to be for me to be there right and then i realized that i'm different here but i wasn't conscious of how i'm representing myself or me be, me carrying you know asian americans on my back mm-hmm. um I wasn't conscious of it when I was younger. I was conscious. I became very, very conscious of it when um, a little bit of it in college, but college, like everyone is kind of on the same level. Mm. You know, you have people the same age. There's a bunch of international students. So no, not, not like that. But when I started working, 
as actually in like adult world, this is when I was like, it really hit me, like really hit me. Mm. Um, and I was like, whoa, like people do not perceive me like the way I perceive myself. Like people don't see, you know, my personality and my brain. They, all they see is like, oh, you're Asian. Mm. Um, and of course, I've gotten a lot of comments in college, like, well, you should be probably good at math. <laughs> And, and, the th- and then the, the thing is that, like, I was good at math. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I'm like, but it's not because I'm Asian. It's because of me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, By the way, I'm stupid with math. I'm terrible with math, okay? Oh, bad, Let me just... bad, bad Asian. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, now, like, now, like, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely conscious of it. Like, I don't want, you know, I don't want poor representation for my people. So, and I think it's going to be like that for forever, but I also, I also recognize my own privilege a lot mm. of times. Like what? I, oh, well, my, my fiance, he's half Dominican, half Puerto Rican. He's, uh, he's dark skinned mm-hmm. and I, I see like, I see how people mistreat him a mm. lot of times, uh, very often. So when it comes to like talking to management or addressing racism, I, I I usually I'm usually the one talking, mm. right? Because people perceive me way differently than they perceive him, and there's I can I can see the difference. It's really blatantly obvious. People tend to listen to me more. People tend to take me more seriously. I'm not saying that he's. I'm not saying that I'm more well spoken or anything like that. It's just people's perception for some reason of me and of him, mm. and I really recognize that. I see it, and I try to use it to you know my advantage as as much as possible. Yeah, and not wow. to be blind to it. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And are there more challenges being in a mixed relationship? Um, people definitely look at us differently. Mm. I want to say that I want to say that there's challenges, but it definitely opens your eyes towards a lot of things that, like, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, and I think people also look at us because there's a huge difference in height. Like, I'm five ten and he's five five. No way. <laughs> yeah. Boy, got game. <laughs> I know, right? And I always told them from the beginning, I'm like, look, like, no one's going to judge you. Like, if anything, everyone's going to be like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we can throw it down. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. Yeah, so this might I think sound, we get... This might sound off color, but I, it just remind me of a joke that I think my uncle told me that, like, it doesn't matter the height when you're standing. It, it, when you're lying down, it's the same height anyway. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, we're all the same height when we lay down. Who cares? So I think we get more looks because of that, not because of us being in a mixed. Are you in a mixed relationship? Yeah. My wife is, as they say, white. Yeah. Um, so you, you, no, we don't get that looks. It's if Montreal is so mixed, it's insane. If, if you walk downtown, it's like, even in like the suburbs, it's just, it's so normal. Yeah, that's good. It's so normal. It doesn't really... it and. Racism doesn't really bother me. No? No. It doesn't affect me as much. I'm like, all right, well, he's racist. I just laugh. Yeah. I, just, I find it funny that, like you said, it's like 2022 and you're still racist. That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. But people don't like get violence against you or anything like that, right? Um, like, towards me, no. I mean, I yeah. have suffered through racism. Like people been yeah. mean to there's a joke in Quebec that, because in Quebec we speak French, right? Mm-hmm. In Quebec, they don't judge you based on the color of your skin. They judge you based on the language that you speak. Mm, interesting. It's actually, well, obviously, this is my version of Quebec, right? Yeah. There are some people that going, yes, there is racism here. The police department here in Montreal is terrible. Really? Towards black people? Oh, my God. It's horrible. But, you know, there are spots. You know what I mean? spots, yeah. Yeah. Do you speak French? A little bit. But you can get around with English, right? Oh, yeah, easily. Montreal is very bilingual. So, like, can you live your full life there without speaking French? Yeah. There's there's people here, like, they don't even speak both. (laughs) Like... Like, I used to work with these Chinese guys, like Chinese people. Mm-hmm. They barely speak English and French. I'm like, how? Yo, resilience, I'm telling you. But they stick with their own kind, you know, which is yeah. I'm like, it's good, but you're not enjoying 
the whole country. The full experience. Full experience. Yeah. You know, like you're an you're a, let's say Filipino living in Canada instead of a Canadian that is Filipino. Ah, uh, interesting how you put that. Yeah, but you know, Chinese community is interesting because they really, really developed it. I like, know. That, I was thinking about this, yeah. right? How come mm -hmm. in almost every city in North America there's a Chinatown? Yeah, it's really amazing. They really like. They really work. How come together. there's no Mexican town? You know what I mean? I, I know. I know for a fact that like I don't like people from Kazakhstan. I don't think they can plan and organize this well <laughs> like the Chinese do to even establish a town. But the way that because they I mean, cut was, the internet. Uh, <laughs> 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 cut the internet. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, they, they they really managed to organize and help each other and build up a community really fast. And then it's so developed that, yeah, you can easily just live with your own people and never, never learn another language. They yeah. have developed all of their businesses like this. It's great. Yeah. I mean, like there's Chinatown in every big city. Yeah. Like how come there's no Mexican town or there's no Filipino town? You know, there is kind of, but not like, as you said, it's developed. Developed, yeah, it's really developed. There's no Filipino town. No, I mean, there's no. like a spot of the city that, like, if you go there, you know, you see more Filipinos, but there's no really like. It's different. It's different. You know what I mean? Like, you'll see, they have. I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, if you ask a person lives in Montreal, mm -hmm. like, where's Chinatown? They know where Chinatown is. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? There's a spot in the map that says Chinatown. Yeah. Not like, but it's oh. It's not like that for Filipino town, yeah. yeah exactly. They're, everybody knows where the Filipinos are, but they don't call it Filipino town. Yeah. Or Kazakhstan, you know? Well, the thing is that for us, like the post-Soviet countries, like in Brooklyn, like Brighton Beach, like it's all Russian-speaking, like everyone knows. So people from Kazakhstan can easily like live there and be... And there's a lot of people that speak Russian and don't learn English at all. I've met them. I've met a lot of those so because they stay with them in communities. Mm. So it's just, I think it's, for for Kazakhstanis, it's about learning Russian. But what is there a language Kazakhstani language? Yeah, there's a native native language Kazakh, and Russian is an official language. Official meaning that you know all the like government documents, like official documents, can be in Russian for business. Yes. Um, Do you speak both? No, I don't. I speak Russian. Okay, okay. What about Philippines? Is it strictly Tagalog or? Oh no, no. We have like four hundred dialects. Oh, cool. You know them all? <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> That's one thing. Actually, I don't regret it, but like, I wish I'd put more effort. Like my language is Tagalog. It's the business language. Yeah. And then there are added to Ilocano and Vis and Visaya. Those are the three. But the funny thing is, there's actually more people that speak Ilocano than Tagalog. But the American Ooh. says Tagalog will be the number one uh, language. So Why did they decide? Because they came and raped all the women. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing about it. It's terrible. <laughs> That's what they did. And they're like, okay, we're <gasps> leaving now. You, these guys are going to be the boss. And then we're leaving. So if you go to like Manila, like what lang what language do they use for like street signs and menus at the restaurant? That would be oh. most likely English. Really? Yeah, English and then some Filipino. Okay. So but but if you if let's say you visit Philippines, English you're good. You're gonna be Yeah, so I don't, like, I don't need to learn. No, you don't have to learn. Like you really like will get like you'll be fine. Anyway, I think we're there. But before we close out, do you have any last remarks? Last remarks. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, Aaron. It was great meeting meeting you. It was actually my first time to like talk in such length. It was great. I think we should do this more often. Yeah, for the sure. Podcast form, on the podcast format. But to close out is no matter where you're from, I think no matter where you're from, I think we all have way more in common, you know, than we do have differences. And I think we should focus on that more because... Through that, there's, there can be, you know, real positive change and uh, we can all find common language and actually thrive together as immigrants, no matter where we're from, right? Whether it's U.S. or Canada, we all have, we all have so much in common and that is resiliency.
Mm, wise words from a wise woman. Again, Dana, thank you for coming <laughs> on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. And have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you again, Dana, for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, listeners, for listening. This is Erin Del Yosa for An Immigrant's Life. I'll see you guys later.